Good evening. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Richard Rogers, Lord Rogers, uh, back to the AA. Um, it's the uh, it's been a while, I think, since the last time that uh, Richard gave a talk. He has, however, had a number of incredibly intense seminars uh, in the uh, soft room, uh, conversations with Brian Anson, among others, uh, which have been great. And it's, uh, it's wonderful that he's here tonight. I think it's, um, it's rare to find a practicing architect who is uh, so successful, who has been responsible for so many of the key projects of the latter part of the 20th century to also be involved with the issue of uh, politics and the city in such a systematic, serious, and passionate way as uh, Lord Rogers has been. I'm sure <clears throat> most of you are familiar with his work on the government's urban task force between 1997 and 1999, and more recently as the architecture advisor to the mayor of London and member of the mayor's advisory cabinet, he has built on the work that he has uh, developed with his wreath lectures of 1995, really on the, on the issue of the future of the city and uh, the whole uh, topic of uh, urban regeneration, which has been such a key topic. And I think it probably his opinions, ideas, uh, have been more influential than anyone else in terms of the development of government policy uh, in, this, uh, in this country. And that is really something of uh, an inspiration because I think uh, most uh, architects are having a hard time just dealing with their own practice, let alone get involved with issues outside. And it's something that uh, really should be uh, a point of reference uh, for uh, uh, many other uh, people. The um, office, as you know, is also something extremely unusual. Many of them, like uh, Richard, graduates of, uh, of the AA. And it's run in an extremely interesting and collaborative basis with lots and lots of young people who are really part and parcel of the formation of projects. Starting with such uh, key projects as the Pompidou Center, Lord Rogers went on to design Lloyd's Channel 4, and uh, most recently, a number of uh, key law courts in uh, Bordeaux, Antwerp, um, other significant projects uh, such as the uh, Millennium Dome, and of course, a number of large-scale urban projects. His thoughts on the city have been documented in a, in a series of publications, Cities for a Small Country, Towards an Urban Renaissance, and Cities for a Small Planet. And the work of the practice has also been documented in the two-volume uh, Feiden book, Richard Rogers' Complete Works, by Ken Powell, and other publications such as the GA print monograph on the, on the practice. Uh, it's a great pleasure that he is here. As you uh, probably know from the title, the work of Richard Rogers, this is a s different lecture to the one that we originally announced, which was on the question of urban regeneration. And that's partly because of the fact that due to the technical difficulties of having an angled screen, uh, we, we couldn't actually um, have that lecture, which Richard has promised he would uh, come back and, and do that hopefully in the near future. So without further delay, please welcome Lord Rogers. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back. I think I started here in 1952, I was trying to remember, um, before anybody was born. So it's a, a long time I've been at it. Um, I'm by nature an activist, which is, and that doesn't mean that it's uh, good or bad, but I suppose one of the messages that I'm beginning to aim uh, at getting across is that we have to be, as a profession, much more active in all those different fields. I mean, I think architecture is a fantastic profession. I mean, I love my work, and I have to say that the older I get, the more I enjoy it. I think we need to persuade a world out there that we have a very important role and that 
you know, cities specifically, which is my field, uh, is, are design-led. So I'm not going to talk about this, that tonight. I'm going to go through a series of buildings. Though within those buildings there are the, many of the driving thoughts which have uh, formed our, our approach to urban regeneration and, and, and cities. The title, in a way, is actually wrong because, in fact, architecture is not made by any individual. It's a team. It's much too complex to be dependent on one person, especially on a practice of, of my type. So I believe strongly in the, I, in the concept of teamwork. I see a little division between, different, between engineers, sociologists, architects. We all get to, together, and of course, the most important clients, we all get together very early on, ideally on the first day of any job. I'll talk perhaps a little bit about how we do that or perhaps answering in any questions at the end about the way that we, we ourselves work. I very much would like to sort of make this a sort of, uh, not just me talking, but anybody who has questions, anything which we can sort of argue about, I'm happy to argue. All right, let's go to the first image. Every year we go uh, as part of our sort of our work live, uh, we go somewhere to visit a building. This is the biggest building that we've been involved with, which is the Madrid airport. And this is the whole office going out on, on site. Um, there's about a hundred and something of us there, uh, there. And the concept again is that you should be able, that it's not all about work. It really is about uh, a, a relationship of, of people. Uh, it, it's as important to have a the spirit of community as it is to to work. We have a constitution which was just hinted at, uh, which which gives a certain uh, a certain vision, I suppose, a certain direction. The constitution states that there is no ownership of the practice. Uh, that actually the only ownership is a charity, and that if any, if we all go under the famous uh, bus, then the, a charity would own our our practice. That we give a, a third of all our profits or. Uh, to, uh, to charity and that we have a, a, a cap off basically no director can earn more than six times the lowest paid architect and so on so the concept is that we have a, a way of living and this I suppose is the concept of that you need to play as well as to work hard next the offices it used to be a, a sort of a Duckham's Oil Wolf a series of old well, hundred year old buildings and you can see we've done a few additions on the top and uh, This is the main part of the office is over here. Uh, we have a whole community. This is the River Cafe. My wife, who is certainly better known than I, is a, is a chef. Much more important food than our picture, really. Um, it's more direct. And, uh, and, this, and we have sort of model shops and people with small practices and designers and so on in these offices. Next. This is just one photograph to give you. We have, we're sort of open plan office. We don't have specific hours, we do work quite hard. Um, it happens, this happens to be my corner, um, and the only thing I can say is it's got a great view. Uh, I'll come back to this question of view. For me, view is an amazing, um, very important part about architecture. View means eyes, I suppose, but view is what says I it also means space. Next. And by the way, those yellow blinds open and close in terms of sun. So there's an attempt to control without air, we don't have air conditioning, we hardly ever use air conditioning. In fact, no buildings now, no, that's not quite true. Um, buildings for American firms have air conditioning. But overall, <laughs> most of the buildings that we do do not have air conditioning, they have cooling. This is a small house in Wimbledon. Um, in some ways, it's one of the buildings that gives me the greatest pleasure. It was for my parents, um, and it comes to the, the, of, of a flexible space, a very simple structure. Tony Hunt was the engineer. We worked a lot with Tony Hunt. We worked a lot with Peter Rice, business engineer in in uh, in, uh, in Arabs. And uh, he's got f flexible partitions. This is sort of uh, my father was a doctor. It's a library study, and there's a very good integration, I think, between the landscape and the building. In fact, it's really the whole concept here is integration: landscape, artworks, pottery, books, and so on, and in a changeable space, in a space which is very much uh, flexible, adaptable. Uh, within a uh, within a, a simple steel frame, which could be added to. Next, I don't know if you can see, but there's another piece. That's the lodge, 
And now this is my parents' house, but now my, one of my sons, who the design was taking today, would change much of the interior. But in this, at this time, and this is a sort of rather beautiful garden, my parents' garden, um, but the furniture here was 1930 by Ernesto Rogers, um, and this is sort of a, a, a present to my parents when they got married. Uh, and it fits in, I think, you know, very, very well within the, the total concept. My mother was a potter, and again, it's a question of lifestyle, quality of life, lifestyle, as well as a question of, uh, of architectural theory. Next. It comes out of this theoretical book. Uh, it actually, I think, it's, it was entered to the, to the, the, uh, the Daily Mail House of the Year or something like that. I think it became second. But the concept was that it's a totally environmentally controlled space. We fell in love with A, with the rubber, the neoprene zip, and B, with refrigerated panels. And these were the refrigerated panels uh, which were put together for trucks and so on. The concept was you could buy four feet, no, they were in feet, four feet of panel by, uh, by 30 feet, and you could just zip it together. You could get it off the peg. This is 1960, middle 60s. Um, and this is primarily with John Young, uh, my, one of my partners, uh, and now I'm the partner who I work with most. And in that concept, was just, just stood on a series of scaffolding posts, uh, su sufficient so that you didn't have to have a deep foundation that could stand on more as a paving stone. And so you could buy four foot at a time. But perhaps most important, especially in those times, is that it only need, if I remember rightly, one electric fire, two kilowatts to actually heat the building, because actually it's a sort of inverted refrigerator, because it's all solid. You could, and you could uh, take out the, sort of a can opener and put a window wherever you wanted within these aluminium, highly insulated panels. <coughs> Next, and, it will, and the partitions inside, and here's the detail, the partitions were restaurant partitions, which you pumped air into this and they jammed up against the ceiling. Here are the neoprenes, the electrics were behind the neoprenes. These were bus windows. And some of this technology was actually transferred into my parents' house. These panels were the side panels from my parents' house. The structure was different, uh, but it had highly insulated. These are the bus windows which my parents' house also had on, those, on the side, the side windows. But the concept was that you could start with a small building and then just extend it as needed. So a zip, it was called a zip-up house. Okay. Next. And this also reflects the concept that I have a great enjoyment, as you may have noticed, with, co uh, with color. Um, and here's the sort of the concept of the windmill turbine, the, 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 the uh, little electric uh, car being uh, charged up from the from the electricity, clean energy, etc. And the, you could even have a courtyard inside and so on. Next, changing in style slightly. This is where we live now, Ge late Georgian house uh, near a uh, beautiful park uh, and a great building by by Wren Royal Hospital. I suppose that one of the wonderful things about Georgian is that it's, that it's amazingly flexible because it's got a very easy rhythm. You can put nearly anything behind it. Next. And that's the living room. Now my in-laws live downstairs. Actually, it's now my, just my mother-in-law who lives downstairs. And we start on the sort of first floor. Which is, and this is, we tend to call this the piazza. I enjoy, as you, can, as you all probably may know, very much having lots of people around. around. Um, so people come in and out from in this space. As I said, my, my wife is a cook, so she sort of the theatre of cooking as well as eating takes place here. And um, it's a space which is, it's, again, it's about view. It's about internal view and about external view across this, the green areas and then King's Road just behind, which is the urban view. Next. So I removed the interior of the house, as you can see. Our sort of bedroom's up there and the kids' rooms are somewhere up there. And this is a sort of study of, on the mezzanine over here. And the staircase is a, is a careful study, and in, 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 in inherent within the details is the idea of lightness, the, the least material to do, to do the job. Next. You come into what, what used to be a tiny little garden, but it's on the north side, so you never got any light. So we close the garden with this, and then we come in from an entrance over here through the back door, as my mother-in-law's got the front door, and you come up here into the, into, the main, into the main room. Next. Next. Here we are on the top floor. There's a sort of circular staircase that goes throughout. To, I have a, the only garden we have is a very beautiful garden on the roof uh, in the 
there is a sort of battle between me and the fellows, which I think I win. Um, as far as, not just here, but just generally about the fact that you can't have roof gardens in England, but something about privacy. I've never understood this concept of privacy from the roof garden, because if I want to spy on the next door neighbour, I could live in my bedroom, so why should I go on the roof? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the whole concept of, you know, roofs are fantastic spaces, and if you live on, in a terrace house, which is the standard building in England, and it's a great standard system, I mean, it gives you a very high density. Georgian uh, architecture is four times the average density of, of what we build today, and that's an amazing sort of concept that actually we've got, we've gone down to another less density in Europe as, as, as building and construction. We sprawl out into, our, into the land. We are the densest country in the world after Bangladesh. Holland is about the same as us. Um, and we, we waste what little green land we have. And of course, we, 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 by, by having low density, we sprawl. If we sprawl, you use cars. And therefore, we have uh, car-driven, uh, car-directed spra- uh, uh, planning, really, which is the absolute the antipathy to sustainable development, because ecologically sustainable sustainable development. So this is our bedroom, that sort of connects everything. Theoretically, the staircase was so the kids could, didn't have to go through the bedroom. Nobody's ever used a staircase, everybody goes through the bedroom, but that's not here. <laughs> Next. Jumping from, has the smallest building that we've that designed, to certainly the one of the most uh, relevant buildings, or sort of important buildings, I suppose, was the Pompidou Centre. Competition we entered as uh, 30 year olds, Renzo Piano and myself, Peter Rice, who's the engineer, and you know, the team, tiny team. Renzo Piano and I got together basically not just about a year before this, we got together because as usual we had no work and we thought it would be more fun to have two unemployed people than one. <laughs> so you could at least talk. I was actually rather against the concept of entering this competition. Um, I, I'm a product of, I suppose, the 60s and certainly 68, uh, and the student and the workers' revolution. And the concept of doing a palace for a, a president didn't fit into me, into my concept, nor did it a, a central cultural system. Uh, I didn't believe, and thirdly, I never thought it would be built. Luckily, uh, in a, being a democratic young group, I was outvoted and we did the competition, and we did win, which was amazing. Um, and the concept really is about, uh, first and foremost, I suppose you could say, pub- the intermingling of pu- public and private zones. So the piazza, which we, and out of the 698 entries, I think we were the only one with a major uh, public space. So there's a big piazza. This is the competition section rather than the final section. Not far, actually, no, this is the, uh, not quite the competition section. Uh, just, uh, it was the first design of that. And you'll see the, comp- <coughs> the competition elevation in there. There's a great piazza here. The concept was that People would stand here, they would go up, the public domain, and this would be the co- uh, streets in the air, the escalators on the outside. So the public domain expanded vertically up s- outside the building. These were large platforms, 50 meters, we used to say two football fields with no vertical interruptions. So if you're going to have flexibility, then it means your mechanical services go on the outside and your movement goes on the outside, and this is just space. And only later on do we start really planning these floors. Uh, on, on the basis that you didn't need to, that change, the adaption was the critical element. The real, the, the concept really was that, you know, in the in the classical days, uh, in the days when one built sort of classical buildings, temples, or, or or whatever it may be, these were formalized, and nothing could be added to them, and nothing could be could be changed. That was the sort of the classical concept. In the days that we live today, you know, it's all about change. The client changes, the next client changes. We don't know where the economy is. We don't, we don't actually have an image. You know, what is a church? What is a house? What is a cultural center? This is a cultural center. Um, you know, the best club I know in Rome is in the church. So what is a church and what is a nightclub? Um, you know, if there is a whole question. And therefore, the structure and the eco-sustainability, the pe- movement of people and so on, is what expresses the building rather than which is the floor for the library, which is the floor for the, for the museum, which is the floor for the design center or the, or the public spaces and so on. So that was the basic, the driving form. The other element was to put the building right on the edge of the site so the street was kept going all the way down here. Usually these buildings are put in the middle, these big monumental type of buildings. This was to create a big piazza on one side and a tighter, much tighter street on, on that side there. And terraces could be cut into the building again wherever one needed it, like that terrace up there on the, right next to the restaurant. We put the more sort of popular things at the top, like restaurants, cinema, some of these have changed. 
It says to draw the people up. Next. This is actually the competition entry. And it was a more dynamic, uh, though the building uh, overall followed the concept. I, this is the public domain uh, side of it. This is the piazza here, car parking and so on. Music research center was down below ground. Elevators, or lifts were in the center here. We put them on the side. These were the escalators, actually. We, when we started to work it out, we had to have much more space, which is why it goes like this now. Uh, but perhaps the most exciting part of this building was that we had all this information. The idea was that, you could con that the facade should not again be static, but it could inform the people who were looking at it. Um, and so you could know what was going on, at, whether it's at the Tate or the Museum of Modern Art, or what political situations were. And in fact, in the end, this, it was all uh, just a year before the opening. Everything was in place to have this facade on, this dynamic facade, which we uh, use a lot of technology from Tokyo, from Japan. Those who've been there, and the technology exists. But suddenly, the new Prime Minister, Pompidou, died a year before we could open it, a year too early. Um, and uh, the next, you just got this, this thing who, like in all these situations, hated the idea of having a building which was not in his name. So he really did everything to undermine the building, took away uh, budget, so that the maintenance systems have never worked properly ever since, and all those ridiculous things which uh, people in power do just to try and show that they've reduced the, the, the budget by two or three, uh, two or three percent. And one of the things he said was, yes, that's very exciting, but who's going to control it, the, politically the left or the right? And I said, oh, it's not political, it's cultural. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, he probably was right. Um, I'm right in the sense of, of, of using it as a, as a that culture is a political weapon. Next, that's the building. Uh, there's the escalators. There's the, the corridors in the air, the streets in the air. Obviously, again, much influence the archigram, constructivists, the futurists. Um, you can you can see roots. I was in the same years. I say proudly as Peter Cook. Um, and you can see much of that sort of the discussion of those days within this, this building. And the, in terms of public domain, this was a really poor area. Uh, Leal is on this side over here, um, and unfortunately that was destroyed when we got the building about halfway up, but everything was very compact. And this was the biggest brothel area in Paris, and the way they were dealt with the brothel area in the 1930s was they decided they could, could change the area by removing all the buildings. It became a massive car park. The, prosti the prostitute showed a great, much greater imagination and moved one street back, and, now, and, that, and that became the biggest brothel area area in Paris. Now it's changed, it's over here. Um, <laughs> so the thing is, you can't, the point I'm making is, you can't do it simply obviously by destruction. You have to, there's more to it than that. And this car park, which we then we became the base for this competition, and this was the building that we put in. It became, it's sort of a cultural machine in a way, which is adapting and changing. It has been radically changed about, well, pretty radically changed about two years ago. I won't go into it, all that. Because it, when we built it, it was a library, it was the only public built library. Now there's the Dominique Perot National Library up here, which is massive, which has changed the nature of this building. The museum was going to be a museum of up to art up to 1980. Well, we're now in 2002, and art has doubled the amount of so spaces are changing, the activities, some of the failed activities have been replaced, and so on, which is the concept of a dynamic, changing, adaptable building. Next. And it's about people watching people. This, you know, this great, for me, the most enjoyable part. Um, you, know, you go to, you know, I love being on, you know, on the Paris street or now in a cafe life in London and the watching, watching people. Um, people next. On, uh, the side on the road, I call it the back side, I suppose you call it, call it the front, which is the mechanical services. And they have a short life. I'll talk about that with Lloyd. Short life and long life, serve and servant activities. Next. And this is people watching people. This is people going up on the escalator, people looking at a view, Montmartre in the distance, this wonderful French skyline, and people watching the magicians and so on below. So people watching up and people watching down. Next. And again, that's the slick. The circus comes to town. The concept of, again, of a space where public can dominate with their type of activities. Next. Pompidou said it was a attack on all sides of us who were building it. Uh, I remember there wasn't a single article 
positive as in one single media thing in the five years that we were building it, except for one, Ada Lewis Huxtable in New York Times, 1974, I remember it very well. <laughs> but we were, we th when Renzo and I sort of heard we won it, and uh, we thought, wow, you know, this is going to be fantastic. Well, in a way, it was actually unbelievably diff difficult. There were numerous court cases uh, against the jury. Jean Prouvé was the uh, chairman of the jury who selected the building and he was taken to court because he wasn't an architect and how to be chairman. You know, this, this is sort of, and that's why one of the, one, one of the points obviously about uh, having a, a broader vision. Jean Prouvé was one of the great, as far as I can say, he was a great architect. He, he may not have got his qualifications. Um, and we had many, more, many court cases, we went from crisis to crisis, but because we had brilliant, a brilliant client, Bordas, he really was the reason that we built the building. Um, I often say there were seven mass, massive crises, and I'll just mention one. Uh, when we got this, we had, this is a very, uh, the Santa Pompidou was a very low cost building, uh, and uh, it's basically a big decorated shed. Um, and uh, when we got the steel prices in, they were in at about three times the prices. They clearly had been rigged because we had, they had about, uh, we could only go in those days to French manufacturers and all the manufacturers had got together and rigged the price. When uh, I went to, went to see my client Bordas, he said, I'm sorry, it has to be a French. I've been in touch with the Minister of Production. Of course, Minister of Production means Minister of National Production. So, of course, you can't go abroad. Uh, so he said, I'm going on holiday for a couple of weeks. I don't know where you want to, I don't want you to go anywhere out, out of this country, but I'm going on holiday. So we rushed out of the country, went all around the world, Arabs and, and us, and trying to find somebody who would break the ring. And we did, we found two great uh, socialist organizations which were willing to step in for the freedom, which is Krupp and Nippon Steel. Uh, I say that in the, sort of, in the sense of you, historically they certainly aren't. Um, and they were terrific, and we went in the way with, with the crook because they were the local. But the, the, the bravery of the client was that he knew that we were going to get, go out. He knew he was going to take a chance. And actually, as we went in to sign the contract, a little brown envelope arrived, which we knew were in French industries, and we'd guessed. Well, in fact, we'd opened the, the, the envelope, and it was about 1% below the price of the of, of crook who were going to sign. And our client very bravely said, as far as I'm concerned, I don't want to see what's inside that envelope. You can give it to me when I come out. After we signed with Krupp, he came out, he opened the envelope and said, oh, what a pity, if I'd only seen it just before I'd, I'd have signed with the French industries. And the point I'm making, the relationship between architect and engineers client are critical in these type of situations. And just to, what, in, just to end it, the client that we dealt with, who was put in charge of this, uh, was a highly experienced uh, judge. And when I asked him in the early days, when Renzo and I sort of asked, well, why are you, kind of, what have you built? He said, oh, I haven't built anything. But I was in control of the French withdrawal from Vietnam, and I thought that was a really good answer. It was just <laughs> like that. <laughs> Next. Oh, sorry, go back one. Sorry, can we go back one? Yeah. Lloyds of London, another competition. So after, after Pompidou, we had no work, two years of no work. John Young had started mini-cabbing. I'd gone off to teach in, in the States at Yale and UCLA. And then we managed to get on the shortlist for, uh, for Lloyds, Gordon Graham, because then the president of the RIB, somehow squeezed us on, like, though we had no knowledge of offices. And we managed to win this, uh, this competition. And Lloyds really had, it was an interesting organization. I mean, it was started in 1977, uh, sorry, in 1770s in a cafe called Lloyds. Um, and that had numerous buildings, and specifically in the, uh, in the 20th century, between 1900 and 1980, which is when we came on board, they'd had something like three buildings in 50 years. So they were tired of changes, so we wanted a building that is flexible enough to meet our needs in the next century, and it, it has to be a marketplace so we can see people. So it has to have a, an atrium, which is the only way you could do it, that the old building had an atrium, so you could see the market. And what they're doing is not a bank, it's insurance, and the buying and selling insurance. It's like a fish market. Yeah. Um, and so that if you're going to have that type of element, then basically, again, you had a served and a servant space. And so the warehouse part, what I call the warehouse, which is where the people are, the simple rectangular box you'll see in a moment. And then these towers is, are the areas which serve this, this big space. In other words, it's actually it's the servant activities. 
And this is the tallest tower on the only corner, the only public space that there is around here. The rest is the medieval streets, uh, which is very, very tight, so it has no formal facade. And the, the number one tower, as it's called, marks the main entrance. So there are actually six entrances around this building. Next. If the big difference between Boburg and Lloyd's is that, in a way, Boburg was a fun palace. Lloyd's is a club. Uh, it's very English. We're the people who, are, who, who run it. They do it on a very classical, traditional concept. This would be a normal plan, you could say. But this is a site, um, and you would have your, because you have to have an atrium on the inside here, taking escape distances and so on, you'd have a series of cords around the edge. This is a diagram, obviously. And we say, but if you do this, you don't have any flexibility. And also, the one part that changes continuously is the machinery, is the engine. The rest, you know, we're all still the same sort of height, and we work very, in some ways much in the same way. We're individuals on a piece of ground, around a big atrium. So we said, okay, we'll move those outside. These have got short life. Lifts are like cars. They aren't cars. They just go vertically. So you're going to change those lifts. Those are the lifts up here. So if you want to change them and speed them up, or if you want to change the, the, the mechanical systems, electronics, the red part here, then if you don't want to disturb the work going on in here, then that's the part that you should get to. And that allows total flexibility here. And then it means that this building could be a university. If, it, if the economy goes wrong or, what, or if it goes right and you move from here, then it can be a university, it can be an office building. This is a standard 15-meter floor uh, slab all the way around the atrium. So that was the concept. Of course, architecturally, it allows you to play with light and shadow against the, and have a, a, a dialogue between the, the blue tower, shall we say, and the yellow edges. And these are the mechanical surfaces feeding in around it, around it. So you get that form of plan. Next. Basically, it's all medieval streets along Lloyd's. So what you're designing again is not in a formal way, um, even much less so than the Pompidou Center, which has the great piazza in front. You get glimpses. So the building, in a sense, responds to glim glimpses. We went to, uh, to the sort of hills around, sort of, we went to Highgate, uh, we went to uh, uh, sort of m considerable distances and, went and did sketches. So there was a formal element between obviously the, 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 the building uh, and the function. And the functions I've mentioned, those are the, the fire stairs and so on, the air conditioning. And, uh, and though there is air conditioning here, uh, there's actually also triple, the glass is triple glass and the air conditioning moves <coughs> through the glass to minimize the amount of energy needed and also allow you to go right up to the glass so it's not going to have uh, coldness during the winter or heat during the summer. So it acts as a, a living wall, the, the triple glass system that we have here. And this is the great atrium. And because, if you remember the plan of the plan, there's nothing in that atrium. It's a great big sort of vertical space that you'll see in, in a moment. But again, the concept really is of a, of a series of pieces coming together into the form and that play of light and shadow. Next. And there's the great atrium, the escalators moving up here. These are the people insur doing insurance. And then as you get up here, there begin to be offices. And Lloyd's has gone through many crises and expanded and contracted. And they just let off space. And historically, it's always been the most, ex they get the best rents in London for the space up here. Next. And that's the atrium going upwards. It's a concrete structure. Concrete you can use in at least two ways. One, you can do it as a skeleton, rather more like steel, which is the way we always use it because we like the whole question of, of, of lightness and transparency. Or you can use it in mass, as Corb often did, um, as solid pieces, both are as valid as the one as, one as the other. Next. The building steps down towards the lower area down here. Uh, there's a rather beautiful market just down here. Um, and the taller buildings up here, and they're getting taller and taller. We're, I'm going to show you another building uh, later on, which, is going, which will be a sort of 50-story building, which we're building actually to replace that one here. Uh, but still, and the, that, that time, and, so, and the section is still that type of section, and this will respond to that. The building is basically stainless steel and translucent glass with windows let in into the translucent glass. The Maison de Verre, the Charo House, always influenced us greatly in the whole concept of, of the way that translucent glass sparkles and is transparent but is also private uh, has always excited us. Next. Moving from Lloyd's, I'm going a bit more quickly, this is Channel 4. Um, here again, the question of public space. There was very little public space in the Lloyd's building. Um, though the, the concept of reason was that the restaurants, the cafes on the lower ground floor, or the ground floor, would be public. Of course, security 
came and closed the space because they got worried about <coughs> bombs and so it's not as public as we would have liked it. Um, this is a little public space in front of the television, Channel 4 television, so there is a public space together and there's a beautiful garden at the back which the restaurants overlooks around a, 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 a courtyard which is a public garden. Um, the concept really is this is the only special part, this is where the special electronics, the special television, the studios are down below here and then these two wings are really simple offices and of course, again the skyline is a view of the, of, the, of the fifth elevation which is this elevation which marks this as the cooling systems uh, which marks the, the, the sky and the change of form. These are the meeting rooms which you just about can see up here which are all prefabricated. Next. And that's the atrium, that's the space where people m meet after all uh, television is something which goes more than eight hours a day so people can meet here, talk on the steps and you come through and this whole question of lightness, transparency, uh, a minimum amount of material it's very well off the writing reflect shown this. This is Peter Rice's last job working. He died of, uh, when he was in his 50s. Um, and I think it was a, a wonderful piece of, of design, this, this light curtain of, of glass. Just kind of leave there a series, from a series of fingers up here. Next. This is your approach to the building. Next. This is going into the cinema. And again, a question of the detail, of the finish. The, you know, the excitement depends on the building. The excitement when you have the possibility of detailing you know, the, sort of the smallest of details. And actually, you walk into the building across this glass roof, like just up here. So that you know, if we can just about see the walkway there. And you look down at people gathering here. Next. A number of courts, as previously mentioned. Uh, this is the Court of Human Rights, the European highest court. Uh, it's the court we keep on losing at. Um, and uh, that basically two courtrooms, one, one and two. It's on in Strasbourg. Uh, there's a large number of offices at the back and meeting rooms which are over here. Next, this is the entrance. And again, the concept is that people who these sort of people can sit on the steps. That people who object to whatever is going on can can sort of make a statement out here in, the, in that public space, which is out here. And the building is highly transparent. And that's the entrance space <coughs> and these are the two courts. Next, it's rather a beautiful site. Strasbourg is a city which has radically changed. Uh, it's become one of the best organized, has a wonderful trans system, it uses its water system and so on. Again, very much due to the fact that it, just about uh, when we entered the fray here, they had, we're going to build a ghastly building here and they asked Mitterrand to open the building uh, in the co and it hadn't been built, it was just the plans and Mitterrand, who was a very shrewd person, uh, when he saw the plans, he said, not only will I not, uh, will I not uh, open this building, but if you build it, I'll never visit Strasbourg again. Now, I don't think they minded that, but the implication of that was obviously <coughs> we won't get any money from the central government. So they scrapped those plans and they ran a competition. We won it, um, and Mitterrand did come to open the building. But basically, this, was the, that's, this is the building. It's, um, these are roof lights next. And the new, a mayor took over, a wonderful mayor, who took over and became Minister of Culture later on in, in, uh, in France. And she changed the town radically. But it took 10 years. It takes a long time to make changes. And as I know from my work, we had the Urban, Urban Summit well, a few weeks ago at Birmingham. And we were saying, actually, we've been working at it for three years. And we are right at the beginning of the Urban Regeneration Program uh, in England. This is one of the courtrooms. Next. Another court, uh, this is a magistrate court in Bordeaux, fabulous town, great food, wonderful wine. Um, we were delighted, we were being very fortunate with our competitions because we often think, God, we could have got this, won this competition in the, in the North Pole. Um, actually, the, these, the, we've had the luck of, of living in these sort of, uh, these sort of towns. There are seven courts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven courts. Um, there is a small pool here, and this is the cathedral square. So it's that diagonally off the cathedral square. There's a historic wall that is part of the square. You can just about to see it here. And one of the concepts, one of the major concepts was eco-sustainability. We wanted to use about a third, or at least under a half the amount of energy that a normal building uses. So we use this pool out here, water, to cool the air in the winter and to warm the air in the summer. So we created this pool next. And of course the skyline, which, which is, now that's the old wall which goes back into the, 
cathedral square, and these are the courts. They're rather like, uh, you, could, well, you could say, they're, they're very much just like some of those farm buildings. Um, they could be oast houses, except they happen to be a wine country. The French say they're like bottles. And each one, held, each one of these courtrooms holds between 25 and 75 people and in magistrate courts. And they're shaped like this because the air basically is taken out of the pool into here and then it floats up and out from the top, which is up, up, up there where there's any piece of glass which is up there. So the whole thing is formed to, to encourage uh, the energy to flow through it and to m use the minimum amount of energy. So one is an eco building, and that's now the most successful one to date. Uh, and B is transparency. Why should a court building be something which is scary? Historically, they always look like prisons, yet when you go into a court building, you haven't even been tried. So the concept is that the public walk up the staircase and can just... This is, a this is again an extension of the, of the piazza. Now this is going to be changed, this is going to be semi-pedestrianized this route here, so it will become much more pleasurable to walk along here, and then people hopefully will move and learn about what, uh, about what a court does by just walking through here. It's part of the interest, of, as part of the public domain to move through here. And then the more private domain is one, one level up, where there's a sort of gallery up here. Next. Just to mention, the sort of, I want to mark up the whole question of eco-sustainability, uh, and again, that back to that whole concept of architects' responsibility to society. And of course, we are in the front line. I mean, we are responsible, or have some, our finger in about 75% of all energy which is used. Uh, buildings use around 50%, transport uh, uses about 25%, so we could argue that we are, how we handle transport and buildings it covers the majority of energy. The other 25% is actually is industry. Uh, and this is really saying, actually the Earth is a living system. Um, it isn't dead. It's like a tree, of which this part here, the fossil fuels, could be seen as the bark, but it's just as much alive and the pith is here. But you have to look after it. You are responsible for it. You have a responsibility. And the only clean energy, the only energy that, that exists in this world is, has come from the sun. There is no other energy, whether it's through coal or whether it's oil or whether it's wind. It's all based from the sun. So you have to harness that, the solar energy which comes from the sun over the, for over the million, millions of years through bio, bio, biology, bio, biotechnology, biology, uh, through uh, earth, uh, uh, earth control, how you use polluted or how you minimize pollution of the ground, uh, how you handle fossil fuels if you do have to use them and so on, wave movement. So wind, sun, um, earth, these are the critical elements that we use to, make, to minimize the amount of, uh, of energy that we, we, that we use. Next. That's the court building, um, a section through the court building, uh, and shows you know, summer and winter, uh, winter sun and how it's the, the water cools the energy and how this is the system I won't go through it. Uh, summer where you've, you've got this small area of glass and how it's the sun is collected and so on and how it's cooled again. Next. And here's one of the courtrooms. Next. Next. And it's one of, the court, one of the courts looking up, that's the small oculus, the eye, and a small area of course lights the whole building very well. There's the acoustic paneling, lighting. Next. One of the courtrooms. Next. And a court, a building which is now halfway up in Antwerp. This is again their courts, it's the end of a very formal city. Antwerp is a completely sort of art, uh, uh, or neoclassical city, Beaux-Arts city, over here, and this is the end of the city, so you get a sort of greenery here, there unfortunately there are a lot of roads, the roads are now being collected to go underneath the building and come through in a tunnel, and the building sits over this at the head of the, of the city. Uh, these are small fingers, uh, 12 meters wide basically, and so that the windows can open and the landscape can be dragged in and therefore cool the building, so you've got the landscape all the way through rather than one massive building, and in reverse the, to, to the Barcelona courts, the wind is now collected by these sails, which is over the court buildings. And this is the Great Hall, uh, where everybody meets again as the public space, which continues through the city into the space and looks over the, sort of, the bridge and into the green areas over here. Next.
and that's basically the, the form of the doing. These are the five fingers uh, into the into the landscape, and these are the great these are the bigger courts where you have these bigger areas and then the small courts down here on the roof of the. To reverse the normal situation, you, they usually put courts below ground or invisible. Here we've said the courts are what's, uh, what, what signal the way that this building uh, does, and you have a great view from the courtrooms which are up on the roof across Antwerp. Next. Berlin, uh, long story, we uh, were in Berlin very early on, uh, and this is Potsdamer Platz. Uh, these are a series of different buildings from offices up here <coughs> with their uh, systems of protection from the sun, which are movable systems over here, the housing over here, shops down here, and so on. It's a collection of, of different types of buildings, for, partly for different clients, um, and which are, uh, will, uh, which are, are let. Next. This is the great atrium. <coughs> Next, tiny building in Tokyo. We've had for years, uh, for some 13 or 14 years, we've had a small office in Tokyo. Uh, <coughs> partly because there is tremendous excitement, as far as I can, in the culture that you meet in, in Tokyo. It's so different to our own culture, to the Western culture, uh, that I like th I like it there as a as a way to watch and see how a different society deals with the sort of problems that we have to deal. The sites are often very small, and this is a typical site. This is an office building, there's a very wonderful restaurant down this lower, <coughs> this lower area here. Uh, as I mentioned, I keep on, I have this love for architectural food. And, uh, and these are offices up here. This is the, actually these are the toilets, the lifts that go up here. And it's very much again about the small detailing. Next, you can see some of the details here. The in, in the building. It's a rather beautiful staircase that goes up the side of the building. You're looking down over the, into the restaurant from the top, and this is the office building. Next. A different type of building. Uh, d near, near uh, oh, actually south of Kyoto, um, is some laboratories, and there was a very beautiful hill. So we didn't want to put a building on top of the hill, so we dug the building into the hill. These are laboratories. Actually, you move through this, up this way, or actually you can park at the top and move down this hill there. And the landscape sort of is taken over the building. This is a sort of typical Japanese type of landscape. Next. And it's much more of a grotto building. Next. Changing completely. This is a critical, it's a shopping center. They actually, um, the railway station is here, just about over here, so it's actually all on brownfield land. And instead of putting a uh, a shopping centre um, in uh, usually you have all the cars around the shopping. We've re inverted it. I often say that the, the game, the name of the game is for architecture is to get the constraints and try and sort of see them in a different light, to sort of put them upside down and see what falls up. And here we decided instead of putting all the cars, say the first thing you see is cars, put the cars in the middle, and then when you park the car, you can see that where they're going in the shops. This is a lightweight Teflon uh, tented structure here. Next which gives you a very exciting skyline. And this is where you park the cars basically here. Next. And in fact, the cars are below, as Paul Rudolph, who was my professor at Yale, he used to say cars are okay if you look from above. Well, I'm not sure cars are okay, but certainly they're better than looking along the, the oil sleek, sleeks at, at road level. So you're seeing the cars below. And when you park the car, you can see which shop you're going to, and vice versa, you can see your shop. And this is a walkway, a sort of cloister, all the way around. The, uh, this is an Ashford Kent. Just next. And here you can see pretty well the, the concept of the section. This again was a pretty low cost, and a very a standard low cost uh, shopping uh, box, but reversed and given a much a very different form of this lightweight tents under which the shops sort of shelter. Next. The dome. Uh, the dome, we started under the concern of the government uh, and finished it under the Labour government, and the concept continuously changed. But what was a wonderful sight because the, the Thames goes all the way around it on three sides. Uh, and what, because we didn't know what the brief was going to be, and I have no objection to that, uh, there has been lots of other things which I don't understand about, well, the building should, didn't have a brief, therefore. Well, I mean, most buildings actually have changing briefs. 
the concept was to make a lightweight structure which could more be easily adapted inside, and it was an umbrella for our, for our climate. Um, you know, the, it's rather like, so the Santa Pompidou has a great square, the climate's better, this is, this is an enclosed public space, and we, just go, and we knew it was going to have a, only a one-year life, but activities would change on the inside. Um, and then it was supported by these 12 masts, and it's about a, well, uh, it's a, k a kilometer around the, the circumference of the building, so it's probably the biggest uh, single enclosure. Uh, this is actually a, a, a cooling space in the way there's a tunnel underneath here, uh, the, and this is a, a hole that goes down to bring uh, cool air to the tunnel below. Um, and then, uh, and this, again, this concept was that it was going to be very well landscaped all the way around here, and actually the edge is very, is very beautiful. We did a very careful job in terms of sustainable uh, development of the planting along here. Next. And it's translucent, and these are the energy centers. Um, it's primarily, uh, it, it doesn't really have uh, air conditioning, but there are, there are some, there are cold water systems, and there is some cold air for some special uh, conference spaces. And again, it's very much about the detail of the mass, the way that you put it together, it's constantly, you know, the, the small is as important as the big, and the interrelationship is between big and small gives it scale. Scale is not about height or width. It's, a, it's much, there is a two course. It's about, scale is about the human hand and its relationship, the human hand to the eye. Next. The Teflon fiberglass coated skin. Originally it was going to be PVC, and then one of, the, one of the more intelligent things that the government did was to say PVC is not sustainable, go, on, go and find sustainable material and it gave us a, small, a little bit more of a budget. Actually, and we found and we developed the sort of Teflon fiberglass coat, which, uh, coating. Um, in, in terms of life, well this has probably got, uh, steel structure has got as long as anything you want. And the building itself is very, very cheap. It's, uh, it's about the same cost again as a crypto shed, shopping centre shed. So it went up very well for us. It was a very exciting job. It went up in about, well, exactly in the two years. We were very worried that we were going to have real union problems because it couldn't be a day late for New Year's Eve. Um, and actually, it was a brilliant piece of work. The, the contractors worked very, very well. Um, the, 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 uh, the client worked very closely with us. Everything went very well, so we get it on cost. In fact, we gave money back to the government. I think it was about 50 million pounds, the actual cost of the whole of the structure. Um, and uh, it went well on time. What we didn't allow for was what a mess they would do inside. Next. And, okay, this is not a bad, this is quite a nice picture, but actually most of the activities had, there was an inclarity about what it should, was going to go on inside. And there we kept on saying, you've got to have uh, someone who makes the decision about what is the nature of this activity. You need a ringmaster, if, this is, if you think of a circus tent. We never had a, a, a ring master. So while a variety of different elements, some very good architects worked in here, not, not these, of course, Zaha. And we ourselves did this little space over here, which was called the rest zone, which is any place where you had nothing to do, where you could go and rest. Uh, and this was this, I said, for us, it was a success. For the government, it practically brought the government, nearly brought the government down. Next, because then, of course, they didn't get their six million they promised, they suddenly came up with the idea that there should be 12 million visitors. Though Disney was saying it should be, oh, you'll never get more than 5 million. And in fact, they got about 6 million. But because they said they'd get 12 million, of course, it was seen in a very negative light. But it, you do come back to the fact there were serious problems with the use of that inside. There were many people enjoyed being there. Changing completely from a, a sort of uh, an idea of a, uh, of a public building, these are guys, to a series of very low-cost private buildings. These are offices in Chiswick. And again, we've tried to reverse the situation. Instead of putting the car through the center, these are four-story offices, you'll see them, so about half-built. The landscape has gone in first. There's a beautiful park done by West Eight, Dutch architects and landscape architects, which have built this. And the road is around the outside, but about 60% of the people, in fact, I think it's even more, uh, come in by foot. There's a, there's a tube station here. There's actually another one over here. And so people get to their buildings by foot. So basically it's around this big lake, the wonderful, the wonderful lake, and there's a rather beautiful wooden bridge across here. I spent to another bridge across over here. And then there are a series of buildings around it. These are simple uh, pavilions. Next. And this, this is just a very simple pavilion. Um, 
you know, very low cost with this, you can't quite see it, but there's a water over here and the landscape is all the way around. Next, you can see you begin to see the water. And so the center, the heart of the space, is a place to, to promenade, to walk, um, to enjoy, rather than the usual road and car park. Next. And it's very much about the detail, about the casting and so on, on a very low budget. Fair case. Next. Housing, a critical problem as far as Britain's concerned, but actually most of, most of the world, is how do you lower the cost of housing and how do you up the production rate? This is a study we did with the uh, Korean steel and uh, furniture uh, uh, companies, and the concept was that you could build a simple house and that could be stacked around a very simple core, a concrete core with two lifts all the way down, and you could stack it from a two-story building to a 25-story building, which is what this is. And depending on how you use it, you could have terraces, you could have glass, or you could have solid. But it was absolute, the plan was exactly the same on every four. Clearly, the, what the Koreans were thinking was China, with its massive one billion people population. Um, and the only way we could do what they asked for, which was basically to reduce the cost to something like a quarter of the normal cost of a building, was to stamp it out of steel. We looked at all sorts of systems and we stamped it out like a, sort of a piece of, well, like a car. Uh, and the concept was to build hundreds of thousands of these absolutely two-person units. You could possibly push two, uh, two units, well, you could push two units together to make a four-person unit, but they were all right based upon really a two-person unit. Next. And, and you stack it, and here you see it. They, even the kitchen was stamped out, all the furniture, you could fold it away. It was so, such little space that everything folded back into the system. We worked with these other wonderful uh, kitchen manufacturers, uh, and, and, and the furniture became part of it. Now, this is exactly the reverse. There was no flexibility here. It's very much like the, the, the car, the car. You can't change it in here. It was all about low cost and the maximum, and maximum value for what little money there was to try and gain as much space as possible. So here you get your one, two, and then you're building it up, the number of stories. Next. Coming back to London, we used to say that we had two-thirds of our work abroad and one-third in England. Now we've got two-thirds of our work, and it's actually in London, which has some advantages. I happen to be a cyclist, so I can go by, by, by bicycle to the sites, and I enjoy that part. Um, and it has, but it also reflects uh, an acceptance in England of a greater acceptance in England of modern architecture. I won't say it has accepted, but we have a greater acceptance. These are a block of flats in uh, Battersea. I'm sure you can recognize where it, more where it is. This, uh, and uh, these are a series of towers, and these are the flats. And it, the slope, next, uh, next one. The slope is due to a very beautiful church, a really wonderful little church. So the building drops down to the same scale as the church at one end and builds up at, this, at, this, at the far end over here. It's glass on the west side and the living rooms, and on the other side, which you saw before, it's, 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 uh, it's tiled and glass. And these are the terraces. Next. A few, uh, office building, uh, Lloyd's Register of Shipping, unbelievably cramped site. In fact, it's impossible to photograph it. It's a very big building. Nobody knows that it's actually there. Um, it was one of the lost battles uh, there's a planning authority because, in fact, there's a beautiful courtyard in front and a ghastly building at the end of the, uh, the courtyard. We wanted to demolish it. <coughs> it belongs to Lord's Register of Shipping and this is Lord's Register of Shipping. But the planning authority said, no, this is a conservation zone. You can build a massive building behind, but you can't remove this tiny little, uh, little building in front. These are the elevator, the, uh, the lifts, and this is the great the atrium. It's a very complicated site. Next. And again, it's very much about energy. It has a very sophisticated system of, of panels which change depending upon how much uh, sun is coming in, how much energy, and so on. So we can, this is the main element, is the, uh, apart from the chilled beams, apart from a very sophisticated cooling system, the main system is really in glass with, this, uh, with these uh, louvers. Next. This is the courtyard, the church courtyard. This is the uh, old building all the way around. Next, this is one of the, uh, from the elevators, one of the, and you move from the elevators and walk across these glass floors. Next, and another small building, well, another building about 300,000 square feet uh, in Wood Street. Um, and that's again, it's a, it's a spec building that has a, a beautiful uh, entrance at the ground level. 
this is again a very simple building, uh, lift tower at this end, there are actually three buildings, three fingers, which mount up. There's a, a tower by Rem, so it's low on the side and it mounts up and up and up. You can't see from that slide. This is actually a building by Norman Foster, uh, down the road. Or next. And that's the, uh, you the, the end of the building. There are three of these slices, four, uh, one, two, and three. You can about see it over here. And these are the lift towers that feed into those, into those slices. Next. And here you can see the slide one, two, three. As they build up on the very triangular site. And there's a Terry Farrell has built this massive building over here which st straddles the road and makes it, makes it very difficult to actually build anything in this position uh, because of the size of this. And there's some poles. And that's the Foster building. Next. This is the entrance I mentioned. And in a, it's what it's saying is you don't have to have an atrium. You can make a handsome entrance if we had the, enough floor height here you know, without, without the need of, that, of, the, of an atrium. Next. The building which in Paddington, actually we're now building a different building because they decided it was, Paddington decided they didn't want any towers. Uh, this was going to be a building which had hotels, studios, and housing all in the same tower. In the same tower. Uh, and it was a triangular, triangulated plan. There were three sides to it. And you could slip in different types of elements around, the, around the, this, uh, this tower. 140 meters high. We've now got 120 meters high. And the sad part is no longer mixed use. This was a really truly mixed use. Next. And the concept was this is sort of it, the lifts were in these triangles. There was a big atrium in the center here. And you could have, as I said, hotels, offices, or housing, depending upon the but really much depending on what the client wanted to develop on any one of these floors. Next. A hotel which we are building in Barcelona, we have a small, we did nearly all our work in London. We have a small office in Barcelona, it's actually expanding. I love Barcelona, I'm actually uh, the advisor to the mayor of Barcelona on the new generation. There have been three wonderful mayors in Barcelona, so we have <coughs> 15 years of continuous uh, uh, development and in my opinion Barcelona is without doubt the the best urban uh, the best city as an example of modern urban regeneration. They've cleaned up all the water side, there's amazing beaches, those who haven't been there, they have the very good housing, there's a tremendously high standard. So this is a hotel, two hundred and fifty room hotel with a with a conference center at its base, um, eating and, and other activities in its lower part here. Next and the right and these are the, the the rooms. Next. Jumping from the hotel, we're doing a number. We are, we're converting a, uh, a bull ring. Well, actually, it's rather enjoyable. <coughs> Massive bull, an old bull ring in Barcelona. It's number two into a uh, fun palace. Uh, we're doing uh, offices. We're doing a number of jobs in Barcelona. This is a tower uh, which was going to be for Madrid. Uh, and in fact, it won't it won't go ahead. And uh, but it was again one of the more one of the fascinating things with this tower was that the client wanted it to be its maximum height, which was about 50 stories high. Um, but with the amount of area that we were allowed wouldn't stretch up to 50 stories. Um, so what we created the shape, and then the lifts fall off as you go up. So the floors don't get as small as you see here because actually you've got less and less lifts as you go up. But, the, but, but this is the a living area for, uh, for the top executives of the, of, the, of the office. And then you have this, the offices over here. And the, that's the steel framework. Now, uh, you'll see a building, in fact, I'll show it to you in a moment, which we're doing in London, which is based slightly upon this type of principle. Next. Next. This is the one in Leadenhall Street. There's Lloyds of London. You can see by that sort of shape. And this is replacing an, uh, an office building here. This is a rather beautiful office building, which is a CU uh, building, uh, a glass building over here with this piazza, which we are re 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 reorganizing it. <coughs> and here you've got the elevator, the lifts at the back, and this is a public space. And we have a, another interesting problem, which is that we have some, the view of St. Paul's, the curve of St. Paul's is down here. So the building sl slopes away from that. This is the ground floor with a great sort of triangular atrium. Next. There's the view of St. Paul's and so to allow for the view cone, the building steps back like this. And then the elevators are back here. 
and it, as it goes up, so the floor space captures the space where the lifts fall off. So there's actually space that goes up to here, over here, while maximum lifts are down here, and that becomes a lift core. And that's the atrium area where you go in, and the piazza sort of floats in underneath the building. Next, the model, which we show the Biennale. Next, it shows you, I think you all know what that one is, Norman Foster's. <laughs> So we're going to be a bit higher. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one will be, <laughs> and so on. Uh, I'm all for that. I, I, you know, that's sort of been going on for, for, for hundreds of years. That sort of natural competition between, not only between architects, but also between, obviously, it's much more developers and business. Next. Finally, the biggest job we have, which is this Madrid airport, um, and it's a very exciting job because we won the uh, Terminal 5 14 <coughs> years ago, and that's at Heathrow as a competition. Um, we still haven't started. I won't go through the pains and agonies of a 14-year-old public inquiry, nor to the costs, not so much, obviously not to us, but, it is, uh, but to the client, and, uh, uh, millions and millions of pounds, or 100 million pounds at least, to lawyers and all the rest of it. What is difficult for the architects is to keep an enthusiasm going for 14 years. That's the real complication. And also the tendency to be building all the old buildings. Because when you built, when you won the inquiry, then it's all been frozen in aspect because the, the inspector says, I love the building. I saw it eight years ago. It's fantastic. I'm going to protect the architecture. But if you protect the, uh, the architecture, you can't allow for, growth, for change. And of course, baggage changing has radically changed the way it wants, even the, 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 the planes are beginning to change. Anyhow, coming back to, this is a competition we won about three years ago, no, four years ago, I guess, and now it's halfway up, you'll see some bits of the site. Very simple sort of wave here with, with uh, gorges, green gorges, which divide up, so you go always in sight of a sky or light in these gorges in here, uh, through here. Um, it's three times the size, it's the biggest airport, certainly in Europe, it's certainly the biggest piece of infrastructure development in Europe, and it has rail and road and metro. Next. One of the exciting things about this building, um, actually I'll just talk about structure before that, this is one of the bays, now this is the concept of the structure, this big bird, and then you always have a piece of sky coming through at these ends. Next. That's it on site, it's over a kilometre long. Um, and that's the first one, there's a, and there are a number of ways, way. actually the station and the car parking is down back here, and then it moves all the way across, across here. It's steel and concrete. One of the exciting things about it is not only they go unbelie going out unbelievably fast with a very small team of architects in control out in, uh, in Madrid, but it's the way that they think about it, they came right away, they said, we want an airport which will make us one of the four hub airports of Europe because we've got, we can serve the whole of South America. The Spanish language is the most uh, used language after English language. So we're going to capture the, Spanish mar the South American market and that will allow us to have tremendous economic advantages. And so we're going to have a wonderful metro system. I went to see the, 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 the chairman or the president of the metro system, and, he, and the, the meeting went something like this. He said, how the long, far away is it from the last metro stop to the this stop? And I said, 10 kilometers. He says, we guarantee one kilometer per month. Two stations, we, I want one month more for each. That's 12 months. I'll sign on 14 months in case we have any problems. I came back here and I told my good friend Bob Kiley, who's in charge of, of, British, of, of, of London Underground, eat your heart, uh, heart out, mate. I mean, you know, we did, did the Jubilee Line in, what, four years, five years? They're talking about doing, you know, this, doing this in a year. It's a completely different... And of course, it's rather like cutting a salami, and you, they do it continuously. They know what the cost of the salami is as well. <laughs> and it's a totally different... And somehow this can-do attitude is one of the difficult attitudes that we've got to bring to the construction is. I think offices we do very well, um, but overall, any form of big structures we have tremendous complicated. Yet we have to do them. We should be able to do them. So next, and this is, and you begin to see the site here. That that's your 1.4 kilometres long line here, and you're beginning to get these waves across there. Next, next, next. Next, that's the office visit. And again, coming back to the question here, 
Madrid is a fantastic town. He never goes to bed to start with. Uh, no, and it, it, as someone said to me, if you go to bed on a Friday night before seven, seven o'clock, you're a, you're a wimp. Seven in the morning, I mean. <laughs> Next. And this is sort of, this gives you a, 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 some of the nature of the building. Next. Right, that's more than I said. I very much like to, anybody has questions, anything we can want to debate, whether it's the way one works in an office, whether it's the type of buildings, whether it's about uh, social responsibility, whatever it is, maybe there's some, thank you very much anyhow for this one. Thank you. Thank you for this incredible <coughs> tour de force of incredible uh, projects. So, um, are you uh, are you ready? I, I also wanted to actually acknowledge tonight we do have an additional space where we have the video relay down in the dining hall. So I want to welcome also those people in addition to the ones in the soft room and in the back members room and so on and so forth. Maybe I'll just start with a with a quick question because you. Um, touched on <clears throat> the whole relationship to construction. And uh, I think it would be good if, uh, even though you're going to come back and talk about the urban regeneration, to in some ways build on the links between the kinds of practices, in a sense, that exist in the office and the sort of practices that are potentially possible um, in terms of the development of the city. And specifically, I think you were talking about housing, one, one point. And it seems that, that many of the buildings that you're doing, even the ones that you refer to as inexpensive ones, they still have a very specific character, quality, and in a sense, uh, architectural vision. But in terms of our day-to-day um, -day housing, one thing that's really difficult is, is for it to have that, to, uh, to have, as you said, the density, but also, in a sense, a, a, a sort of direction from the point of view of construction, because the construction seems to be so retro and so banal. So I'm wondering whether, in terms of the, the, the question of everyday construction to do with housing, is, is the issue of builders one of the things that, that we, have to, uh, we have to discuss? Or, or how do you think, what do you think is the relationship, in a sense, between uh, housing and the existing construction industry? Housing is the most complex part, there's no mm. question. Mm. I, I think I've already mentioned it because there is a sort of traditional concept that a house is made of bricks and it has a, a picked roof and I know what my tap should be and, you know, and so on. Um, there isn't a tendency, uh, and in other parts of the industry, there's a, do you need a tap or do you need, um, or do you need a door? Mm. Uh, so people carry all this bag baggage to it. Also the building, the housing industry, they aren't, aren't actually, uh, it's not like the, the, the offices, uh, they're not developers in the same sense. Actually, they're land dealers. In general, the big companies are actually, they store land and they make their profit on land. Um, they store it, they get it what they think is a low price, they negotiate and try to get it. If, it, if they can get some green belt, fantastic. They have to get brownfield land, well, it's a bit more complicated. Um, and they become sort of land bank holders. So there's not much encouragement because the building is sort of more static element to it. Whereas in office buildings in the 70s, people like uh, Stanhope, Stuart Lipton, Peter Rogers, really changed the whole office concept. We suddenly became very efficient. We built a very good office building. Okay, it's for tenants. For the big companies, we still build office buildings which are yesterday's buildings. They don't want to challenge tomorrow the, big, uh, the tendency of the big companies. But housing is even much worse than that. Um, I mean, I had a meeting this morning, actually, with Taylor Woodrow, which is probably, in some ways, is one of the better in comparison with some of the terrible ones we do have, the big, of the big ones. And I said, you know, how can we start prefabrication? How can we start looking at a system which, uh, which is not exactly the same as anything else? And they said, well, you can do that, but you've got to dress it in brick because we can't sell it. Well, you're already starting with a sort of weight around your neck, you know. Um, it's all right as long as it is in brick. Uh, okay. uh, now, you, there's a limit. I mean, we, Brick has got uh, some potential, maybe it lightweight or whatever it may be. But overall, if you start with that concept, it's very difficult. All you can do is just try and persuade, and there are some, uh, Peabody, Roundtree, those are some of the organizations which, where there is scope to move, but they're tiny in comparison with the really big ones. 
um, you know, with a Barrett Holmes, uh, for instance. You know, everybody knows what a Barrett Holmes looks like, if nothing like that. Well, else you probably will remember Mrs. Thatcher with got a <laughs> nice Barrett Holmes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the image of, uh, of, of, of that, of, of, well, first of all, of the, uh, of the house speculator and often of, of, the, of the client. But I don't really think it is. I think that if you push it, if you can, you know, Bedstead and Coulston, uh, Dunstan, uh, mm -hmm. where you, know, you begin to see a change, where the whole concept is low energy. Low energy doesn't, look, doesn't work just as a brick house. It's driving mm -hmm. something, uh, changing spaces. Uh, the four million, we're, we're looking for over four million dwellings. One of the shocking and most surprising and very good things in many ways as far as cities are concerned is that of that four million dwellings, 90% of those are single person dwellings. I, when I say they're probably where they're cohabited, but basically they're one bedroom dwellings. Mm. That's what we need. We don't have enough. What's specifically one, one bedroom? So that should be a tremendous challenge. Maybe a one bedroom doesn't have to be a one bedroom. Maybe it's totally different. But if we're talking, actually, I think it's, I said 90, actually said 80 uh, percent is, is uh, single. So, of course, they're the ideal city livers. Because if, if you have a big family, and then you're likely to have a cat and a dog, in fact, lots of cats and lots of dogs, and lots of children, then you, there's an argument for living in the country. But maybe there is. I, I'm not a great lover of the countryside, so I don't have that problem. But um, I, I don't mind leaving occasionally to see the countryside. Uh, <laughs> but then I miss the situation. Uh, but as far as the concept of, you know, of a small family works brilliantly in, in city positions, uh, city places. So we need this, we need to devi devise a form of housing, probably where you can eat, uh, where you have com maybe community spaces, right, so that everybody doesn't have to be in his own little ant space, uh, where there's a rethinking of what living is in that type of situation. If 80% of 4 million, I mean, if, you know, that's... Uh, uh, live in this way, you know, what, are the, what options can you give this 80% to attract them back? The biggest problem we have is uh, depopulation of cities. The biggest single problem is the sprawl, the absolutely non-sustainable sprawl, the holes that we have in cities leaving big gaps. We've all seen, you know, where, and that's where you have crime. Um, it's, you know, it, it's eyes on the street. Forget CCTV cameras. They're most inefficient in comparison with eyes on the street. Of course, if the spaces are empty, then you do need to cameras. So as to get a certain density, uh, at least up to a sort of, I'm going to call it Georgian, wow, that's really daring, uh, a Georgian density, uh, at, uh, which is, as I said, about four times what we're doing at the moment, um, and uh, to create a new type of living, which, which responds to 21st century spaces at a cost that you can afford. I mean, in London, I, you, know, I keep, you keep on reading in that ghastly newspaper, Evening Standard, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, you, nobody can afford to live if they aren't, uh, if they don't, aren't earning 75,000 pounds. Well, um, maybe not 75, but there is something. You can't really get on the ladder if you're not wearing, earning a hell of a big sum. And that, is, that isn't right. So we need to rethink. How can you make, you know, maybe it's a throwaway house. I mean, this is going to, or, which I'm not very much, I doubt whether it is. Uh, but certainly there has to be a way in which you can create buildings with low cost, low energy, ideally flexible, um, but which offer a quality of livability, which many of the houses nowadays don't. That's why most people prefer lofts, given the choice, and why, it's why lofts are so expensive, because that's flexibility. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really, and to understand that, you have to understand the politics, because these big P uh, P uh, companies, limited companies, PLCs, um, are political uh, organizations, economic organizations, Right at the end of it, it's design. Um, so you have to understand the economic and political situation. You have to understand the sociological. I work very closely with a, a woman I admire immensely, Anne Power. I mm. produced a book with her. We work together on the task force. She's a sociologist. She, she's a professor of social at LSC. And what's fascinating is that when I look at it from a point of view as an architect, mm. and when she looks at it as a, a person who has a very good understanding of social exclusion, we come to exactly the same answers. Which, mm -hmm. is, which is exciting, but if you, and she, but, but neither she, I or her are, have had real impact upon the hospital. We've got to be active mm -hmm. and understand our profession. In terms of what you were saying um, in relation to Spain, both Barcelona and Madrid, 
then why is it that it's so difficult after all the involvement that you've had with the urban task force and then now more recently with the, with the mayor, what is it that, that makes it so difficult to really present a more visible image of uh, the city, of urbanism, for example, in terms of London, compared to, let's say, Barcelona? Because that, that seems to be an area where we're having a great deal of difficulty actually can, suggesting what that is. Sorry. We can, yeah, we can, the, the beauty of, where of you know, living today is that we can learn what we like and don't like on a global scale. So you have a constellation of cities, I think, for, and cities that for me is civic pride, um, citizenship, great words. Uh, and you can see it, you can take a look at Barcelona or you can take Copenhagen. Copenhagen, the three places of movement, wheel-driven movement are one-third of all the people in Copenhagen go by car, one-third go by uh, public transport, and one-third of people go by bicycle. Mm. And that's in a climate where two months you can't see where you're going anyhow, it's pitch dark and it's full of snow. Uh, so how they, and the point is it's a cultural change as well. Uh, so you can say, okay, if they can do it, what can we learn from there? Or Strasbourg, which is a great tram system. Um, or Barcelona, which has had a continuous public domain concept, cleaning the beaches, uh, creating 100, 150 new squares, um, uh, creating uh, children's play areas in more as every block in, in Barcelona. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grid city. So, and that has needed three amazing mayors, 15 years of continuous government, of of uh, socialist government in, in, uh, in Barcelona with a real vision. The Olympics were uh, year four of its 15 years um, and that was used as a lever to get money in from Madrid, to get in from, from the Europe, from, from the EC and of course from the people. So again that's why it's political as well as, uh, as, as architectural. So what can we learn? We can look at those different countries, we can use it. Now in this country, good news is, okay, as long as we've got a government it seems to be interested. Uh, the task force for me was one of the most enriching experiences of my life. I had a, a group of about 14 people who, from totally different fields, from, from, from business, from development, from so, uh, sociology, and so on. Um, uh, and, and we all came to the same conclusions, which therefore there's not much, not much disagreement, whether it's my urban task force, or, which I chaired, or other parts of the earth. There's a pretty much a general agreement that the compact, live, work, leisure, well-designed, well-connected uh, city is the city or the neighborhood that, we're, we're, that we are looking for. Now, what happens to our government? It starts it, it's beginning, actually, rather, I think John Pesky is good news, um, but we don't deliver the thing. Uh, we say, okay, we want mayors, and sure, we're now beginning to get some mayors. We want, si and many people are going to be interested in cities are the city government. You can't expect central government to be interested in Back paving stones, or even in communities, well, in communities, city mayors or city organizations can. But they, now the government hasn't given any power, and what power they have given them is that sort of, you know, with such sort of uh, concern that it's not real power. So I think we have to have local power, not just the mayor, but of course the local community to get to, uh, top down, bottom up, and it needs to be done at the lowest possible scale, certainly at least at city, city scale. They've accepted that. Uh, you're not, you can't build on green land anymore, except if you build on brown land. 60% of all buildings now go on brown field land. Um, they've accepted that an increase of density, a little increase, just came up. I hear today that stamp duty has been taken off brown field. Uh, it'll make brown field more competitive with green field development. So the whole of tax breaks, which we're slowly getting. There is movement, but it is extremely slow at all levels. It's a bit like the story about you know, the tube. I don't know quite how you speed it up, except by act action. You've got to get out in the street. You know, that's the only thing I can say. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> can we get a can we get a mic to uh, John over here? Please? Thank you. John, can you take that? <coughs> yes, it's on. It's on. Yeah. It's going red anyway. That's what it is. Richard, I, I've been fascinated and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I have to say that to begin with. Uh, but. but. <laughs> <laughs> That's how all quibbles begin. <laughs> I'm, I really am concerned about talk buildings. And I always have been. And I'm wondering if this concept 
of stacking people up above one another is not getting to be outworn. Uh, the reason I say this is that we now have email and internet and indeed people who are working almost side by side on the same floor are emailing one another. <laughs> now this seems to me to give the opportunity far, far more than it existed uh, of working from home. And it gives the opportunity of real communities where instead of being deserted uh, during the whole of the day, uh, they can be people and women in particular, but maybe men, uh, can be working from home, look after the children, mix with their neighbours, and this seems to be, for me anyway, the essence of living. The other thing, of course, is that the tall buildings, uh, apart from being extremely disruptive in civic design terms, and I would say that very much of London and our own cities, and probably uh, many continental cities as well, create microclimates, and they reduce uh, people. And I know you're very concerned about people because you've said that, and it's quite evident in quite a lot of your work. Uh, it reduces them to ants scurrying about <laughs> Uh, between the buildings and suffering this awful, awful microclimate uh, which the tall buildings uh, create. Thank you, John. I get two parts, maybe three if I get the microclimate. Uh, in terms of live work, of course we do work more and more, those of us who live above the poverty line, which is a small, a small Still more, there's still quite a small uh, a group who really do use IT and so on, not you know, a lot of, of poor offices, you know. Uh, but for those of us, certainly we can work at home just as well as at, uh, in an office, and probably we do. But all the research that I know of, and Castells is probably the best, and I can't recommend highly enough Castells as a thinker in this, in that, in this field of information technology in the cities, uh, all to the point that but people want to meet other people. You don't go to work, you want to meet people. And the successful part in, you know, it's like the piazza is the most successful part of Bobo, it's probably our canteen is the most successful part of our office. Um, you know, in a sense, it's, it's not about so much eating food, it's about exchanging ideas, uh, whether it's the canteen or whether it's over the, over, uh, over the desks or whether it's sort of in those offices that have these corridor bumping that we seem to have fortunately to have to our corridors. Um, so it's the meeting of people, and I think it's a really basic concept, and that's what you can't do in a suburbia very easily, except it's in a very sort of good church hall. Um, you, and okay, you're countryside, you can't, but there you've made a real decision that you prefer the countryside, and I do understand preference for, personally for, for that some people will prefer the countryside. So overall, there's no sign. We all thought in the 60s when we started to understand that it was going to be this revolution, that everybody would go to their IT thatched cottage off into the, into the landscape, specifically in America where there's lots more landscapes than we have, 10 times per person as much as we have. Um, actually, it hasn't happened. <coughs> Overall, people have moved into, into cities. I mean, unfortunately, into the suburbs of cities, so it's sort of arguing where it's really cities. Uh, but there is that, 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 that need. In terms of high, so in terms of high buildings, um, sorry, just to finish it, overall there is a new life, whether you go to Birmingham, whether you go to London, whether you go to Man in city centres. I have to say immediately you have that city centres, it doesn't usually exist, which is a serious problem. But overall there is a movement back to city life and to practically going towards that sort of 15 hour day type life, which uh, not quite to the Madrid and Barcelona, but it's going in, in, that, in that direction. Um, so live, work, leisure, compact. Height. We know perfectly well, and I often say this, uh, in fact I was the last, uh, last Friday in New York discussing the thing about Lower Manhattan. You know, Leslie Martin in the 60s uh, at Cambridge, he, he chaired the Urban Land Institute in Cambridge, produced a memorable paper which I would 
uh, suggests that you might like to look at, uh, which was about land use, land, mm -hmm. uh, land density. And in a simple terms, what it says was, you know, if you take, divide buildings in two types, buildings which enclose space, I call buildings, courtyard buildings, Barcelona, and buildings that stand in space, many of the tall cars stand in space, you, the courtyard buildings are much more effective. And then he did an exercise, basically, of central Manhattan, and he said, if you, at that point, 1960s, I think the average height of a building was about 18 stories, average, probably 25 or more now. And he said, actually, if you do it on a courtyard principle, it would be a third as high. You can have exactly the same area, in other words, but it would be a third as high. As, so instead of having, whatever it is, 18, 17 stories, you would have seven, six uh, stories high buildings. So the relationship between height and planning is very important. Um, and you can have high density at the sort of Georgian terrace type, but square type densities, uh, with gardens and so on. As you can see in Islington, you don't have to go into luxury areas. Amazingly effective high density developments, way higher than what we have. And quite honestly, I'd be absolutely happy to risk anywhere near those densities, and I think there's a lot to be said for it. So there is little argument for high buildings for increasing density, except in a few places which is mainly, which is mainly offices. Now, having said that, there are some people who would like to live high. I wouldn't object to living high. And I think, as again, back to the single person and so on, I have you know, great views and so on. And, uh, I, have, I, mean, I don't have any problems with New York. I've never felt like an ant in New York specifically. I love New York. I love Chicago. I don't have a problem with high buildings. I don't feel this whole question of being compressed. So the only reason for high buildings is because you like them, not because of half density, except in some places where you would have office developments, which are achieved, and the city of London does it when you're starting to look at over 11 to 1 plot ratios, then there's an argument that that leads you towards uh, 140 meters and above type development. In other words, uh, you're now looking, beginning to look at sort of 20 or so stories, which is getting quite, uh, quite, uh, quite high. Um, Probably like Canary Wharf. There's a sort of there's a double reason for Canary Wharf. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. One of them that was that the city was so absolutely insistent in conserving itself in the 80s. We had such a ridiculous situation where nothing could be changed in the city that Canary Wharf was forced. I mean, many of us were saying to the to the city and the city planner, planners, for God's sake, if you keep on conserving everything in the city, you're going to either everyone's going to go to Frankfurt. We didn't think of Canary Wharf. They'll go to Frankfurt or they'll go to Birmingham or somewhere else. Actually, what happened is they went to Canary Wharf. Fine. Uh, unfortunately, at that time, there was only offices, but that wasn't out there. And you do have a very high density. You have a sort of 14 to 1 type plot ratio. Where, and the high buildings, I think, work fine. They, I mean, they don't work because there's not enough housing, though there's beginning to even be that. There's not enough activity after 6 o'clock. Those are sort of problems, but not because the buildings are high. So I think A, you don't have, that people don't come together to work, they come together to live, and B, high is okay in the right place, but it's not an excuse for increasing density, except for a few, in a few places. <coughs> I think I missed some. Well, it's just eco uh, winds and so on. Well, I don't know, I mean, we do wind tests and so on. We should be able to develop uh, office buildings which have a different section at the lower elements to stop that, eat, that, that, that wind element. And also some of the visual elements. Again, you know, we have this tendency to make these amazingly pure elements. I don't know why. I do them too. <laughs> Students, don't be shy. This is a good opportunity to, uh, okay, back there. Uh, you, uh, Andrew, can you, can you, can you take this? Uh, you, on a lighter point, you alluded to the, your sort of work and practice and how you managed to combine uh, fun and architecture, which is quite ironic since our architecture is, you know, we work very hard. Yeah. So how, how have you done it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose one of the ways, and, you know, again, I'm one of the sort of lucky people, if you like. Uh, no question about it. I don't actually make much of a division. I've always worked, I've always had to do some work. Uh, not do, I've just, and as I've got older, I enjoy, I actually enjoy the work. So I take quite a lot of holidays, but I always take some work with me, a bunch of you call work. But actually, those first two or three hours in the morning, I, as you get older, you sleep less. Uh, I enjoy it, so I don't really call it work. Uh, of course you go through periods when you don't, when it's not very good. 
Um, it depends on, on what you want to do. You should. There must be a question of whether you're doing the right job if you really dislike it. But I have to say, you may have to go through a period, a period of not liking it. There's no way it's all going to be, be uh, honey. I would say I had an advantage. I'm, a, I'm dyslexic, and B, I had a real difficult time at the A and everywhere else in educational terms. And only rather late in the day, like the fifth year, began, I began to understand where I thought I might be going. Um, so in a sense, after that, anything was better. Um, so I had a rather different first 25 years, and a much better <coughs> next 45 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is perhaps unfortunate in having it that way around. And I've got a great team around me, and, and we cover each other, and we work very much as a team. I can't, in again, you know, there's no uh, people, uh, lots of practices which are individual, and I think that, and that's, it's, that in some ways it's more difficult. Why not? So there are small individual practices, one person practice, you have you know, our own practice, which is over a hundred, um, then you have much larger practices, uh, you know, and uh, you can sort of try and decide, you have to move around, decide where you like working and how you work. If you want, should I just talk a moment about the way we work? Mm -hmm. sure. uh, we have a series of teams. We have about, uh, I don't know, we have, we have 12 directors um, and a series of a large number of associates. But all the directors, and in fact, there's a sort of Mondays are basically crit days. We pin up just like school. We pin up or because, you know, can't do it on computers, uh, on screens, and we pin up and we discuss projects. And we know which projects are, directors know which projects are, are, need more, more input and they go to those projects with, their, with the teams on a different day, on another day. But Mondays, basically I don't have meetings on Mondays, it's a sort of law that I mean. Actually it came out of a period where I wasn't so happy, like 25 years ago, when I used to come in with a black face on Monday. And John Young said, I know how to make you happy, you just exclude everything else but design, design on Monday. And that's how we do it. Monday is design day. I just staff system. I'm not suggesting there's anybody else in it. But at least we know there's one day where the directors and the key people know they, they don't have meetings. Uh, I don't mean all the other days. So you start with a good day and then um, yeah, at those meetings there are engineers come in, uh, sometimes clients come in. So it's a, a general, and anybody who wants to come in to it, it's an open meeting. So anybody who wants to come in can come in and discuss whatever project they want. We put a list up. We, on Fridays we put up the list that we're going to look at, but we can add, if there's pressure from other people to add to it. So we don't, we as, art, as directors don't have our own style project. Of course, there is a style that comes out of it because architects do have, directors do have, close association with one building or another, if nothing else, from management. But we try and create a appro general approach, a sort of social, philosophical, ethical, aesthetic, whatever it is, approach, uh, which can be discussed as well as drawn. And that sort of drives us forward. We have a very, we practically never, I mean, for good or bad, we practically never lose staff. Uh, most of us, I mean, the good point is that, uh, People don't, li don't usually leave. The bad part could be argued that we don't have enough changeover. Um, but that's, that's the way it is. Luckily, we've tended to grow. So we haven't had that crisis of having to get rid of stuff. But we are quite careful. I and mean, we try not to be too large. I mean, theoretically, I keep on having sizes, which I think is an ideal size. When I was doing Bobo, which was really difficult, and we were working sort of around the clock, I used to think, well, after we finished Bobo, which was quite a small team, about 20, I'll never have an office larger than 12, well, of course. At a certain point, Mark Herbie, business partner, said, well, you, you think a 12 rigid will actually wear 20? And then I said, okay, 30 is the most that you can get around the dining table back to food, and, you know, you can, um, and, you know, where you can really talk, break bread together, whatever it is. And then you know, Mark would come along, well, you think you're 30 or actually you're 50? <laughs> And so on. So those are sort of we, I keep on we keep on putting up limits, mm. um, and then we break. Then I suppose the structure is able to take it. I suppose after sort of so many years together, I mean the youngest partner, uh, I suppose director, um, is uh, Ivan Harbour, um, and uh, I mean he's been with us for 17 years. I think. So everybody's been a long time, uh, and so we know each other. We can practically talk about you know we can design 
Molly quickly because we know each other. And the team concept is very important to us. So what, what do you think are like some of the key um, ideas that are going around the office? Because when you were showing your, your parents' house and just that you know, initial delight of being able to deal with space in a kind of very pure form of structure and the bookshelves and the organization, and then you talked about Pompidou Center um, and really the whole idea with, uh, with, with Lloyd's of the, of the clarity of the space. What do you think are, are, the, are the key things? Because you're working on so many different things that it must be hard to... Uh... The change has been from, you could say, technologically driven uh, buildings in the sense that we were working, we tended to be rectangular because if you've got nothing to grab hold to, apart from the mythology of the city, which is an important part of course. Uh, but basically they tend to be too su eco-sustainable, which is related to technology, because that's one part of the uh, and you still have to build them. Uh, and I suppose you could argue that if you take uh, the Antwerp Law Courts or, um, or, or in fact, the buildings, most of the buildings that I, you saw in the later uh, times, it's much more to do with the wind, the sun, the form uh, in relation to the sheltering with people at street level or whatever it may be there. So you see that type of change. Um, it's fascinating, this question. I'm not, I'm not, it's, it's quite interesting to look. Again, we had this discussion at lunchtime today with half a dozen of the, uh, of the senior people. You know, we're going, we are thinking about doing a, being asked to do a big exhibition at the Pompidou Center. You know, what, does, what is it about? What are we thinking we're communicating through an exhibition? Should we do it? It's going to cost a lot of time, let alone a lot of money. Uh, we have to have something which we can, you know, what is the message, if you like? Uh, what is the approach? It's actually quite difficult. The approach at one level, of course, is exactly the work that we've done, or the, or the book that we've written, or the, uh, the pressure on uh, social, political that we have put on it. So it's difficult to be at too abstract. So if someone says, what is the big change? The only one I can probably grip hold of is, we have a terrific team, which is much more experienced than it was, doesn't mean it's better, but it's much more experienced than it was 40 years ago. Um, there's a sort of, interesting question about experience and being faster. We're much faster than we were 40 years ago. Uh, and what is quality and what hand, whether you're being as creative as you were at, the, at that time. But we have a terrific team. We know wonderful consultants. Um, we know sh a few shortcuts which we didn't know before. But probably the driving concept is very much still there. And so you mm. could argue that Reliance Controls, which was probably the first building of any fame, which is a, sort of mm. a simple shed, uh, which we, Norman Foster, or Team Forday, Norman and Wendy Foster and Richard and Sue Rogers, uh, built in 1965. Uh, perhaps we haven't done much more since then. I don't know. I, I think uh, you have, and uh, it's, uh, it's great that we've uh, had the opportunity to really get to see, I know what is only a kind of slice of all the, all the thinking and all the research and all the activities that have gone behind some of the some of the images of these projects that you've shown us. I want to thank you for taking the time. Thank you very much. Very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're so good with this thing. Yeah. Wonderful. 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 I really enjoyed it. I was going to ask you.